Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Roderick Ireland, and on behalf of the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society, I want to welcome you to the third and final session of our convocation on criminal justice reform. Today's program is entitled Healing the Community and Ourselves, and it will give voice to criminal justice professionals and their informed views on reform from the perspective of trauma and healing. Once again, we have an exciting, dynamic, provocative group of speakers, both locally and nationally. And we hope that their dialogue will enlighten us, inspire us, and perhaps even call us to action. Today, we are honored to have as our keynote speaker, Margaret Burnham, distinguished professor of law and founder and director of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project here at Northeastern University. On a personal note, I have known Margaret for many, many, many years. We won't say how many exactly. And I count her as a dear and special friend. So my reference to her as Margaret is not due to a lack of respect, but just the opposite. Margaret is a civil rights legend and icon. In the opening sentence of her brilliant article on Robert Moses in the July 26 issue of The Nation magazine, she wrote, and I quote, after the 1963 March on Washington in August and the church bombing in Birmingham in September, I knew that at that particular moment in time, what I, then a college student, needed to learn would not come in a college course, end quote. And a few weeks later, in that turbulent fall of 1963, Margaret took a bus from New York City to Jackson, Mississippi, and began working with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee on Voter Registration. And as they say, the rest is history. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Margaret began her formal legal career at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund in New York City. Along the way, as a 26-year-old lawyer, she represented Angela Davis, and then later worked at the Roxbury Defenders Committee, one of our nation's preeminent public defender programs. In 1977, she was appointed to the Boston Municipal Court by then Governor Michael Dukakis, becoming the very first Black woman to serve as a judge in Massachusetts. After leaving the bench, she founded the first African-American women's law firm, along with Geraldine Hines, retired Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and Judith Dilday, retired Justice of the Probate and Family Court. There are so many milestones in Margaret's exceptional career, the time constraints bar my recounting all of them. Noteworthy was her service as an advisor to South African President Nelson Mandela on human rights violations in that country in the early 1990s. And her civil rights and restorative justice program is a continuation of that work. That program focuses on racially motivated civil rights violations in the deep, deep South from the 1930s to the 1970s, with a focus on research, policy initiatives, and remediation. That program has received a number of national awards and recognitions and has been the subject of a number of television programs and films. To cap this off, just in the last few weeks, she was nominated by President Biden to serve on the newly created Federal Civil Rights Cold Case Records Review Board. Margaret is a recipient of many honors and awards including the prestigious Carnegie Fellowship Award in 2016. She is a prolific writer 
In her book, By Hands Now Known, Jim Crow's Legal Executioners will be published next year. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce you to my dear friend, Professor Margaret Burnham. Margaret? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judge Ireland, my friend Rick. Uh, well, he hasn't actually said how long we've known each other, but uh, let me say that Rick was my uh, first boss uh, here in Massachusetts, and uh, that thereafter uh, we worked together in the court courthouse uh, down in Pemberton Square, where he was a juvenile court judge and I was a judge in the Boston Municipal Court, and we've been good colleagues and close friends ever since. Here we are both at Northeastern. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure. It is a real pleasure to be part of this, uh, this uh, Rough and Society uh, convocation. Uh, I can remember uh, the early days of the Rough and Society. Uh, Rick was there from the very beginning um, as was, uh, uh, Professor Ward and many, many of you who are here today. Remember those early days when there were uh, many fewer of us in our court system here in Massachusetts and coming together, um, we came together in person back then, uh, was, a, was, was a, a moment to, to, to reflect and, but also to, to celebrate uh, what we were then doing and what we have done in increasing the numbers of people of color um, in our uh, judicial system here. Um, so I want to uh, thank not just Rick, but as well, uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Bailey um, Laguerre and um, Professor Ward and uh, Jack Proati and uh, Jack McDevitt and all the others who have made this, um, this stunning uh, convocation possible. I've heard uh, about the earlier uh, events and uh, have actually listened uh, to much many of the earlier proceedings and uh, it's a great honor um, to be a part of this. You know, as I, as I say, uh, today uh, we come together and our, our numbers are uh, considerably larger than uh, what they were when the Ruffin Society was first launched so many years ago. And that's, um, that's important, but it's not enough. Uh, the numbers are, uh, help us transform the system because uh, those of us uh, with experiences from communities of color bring a personal uh, life experience and a personal empathy uh, with those with whom we encounter and for whom we have to deliver justice in our system. Uh, but we bring more than empathy. We also bring a deep knowledge about the history of racialized crime control in our country. Uh, and even more than that, and not just uh, the history, but we also bring a, a, a knowledge of where we stand today. And I know that that has been the subject of your earlier gatherings uh, when you discussed the question of reform in prosecutors' offices and in police departments and um, the whole um, engagement with the question of how deep uh, and how broad, how deep uh, reform ought to go in this country. Um, so today, you know, as we come together, we're really, we're, we're, we're sitting uh, on a mountain, we're not at the top of the mountain. Uh, we can't look down the other side yet, uh, but we've come so far uh, from where we were when we practiced um, in these courts in the 1970s. And the whole concept of mass incarceration had not yet even been imagined, much less articulated. Um, so we have a clearer sense of what it is um, uh, we have to, uh, confront and uh, to deal with, and certainly a uh, much clearer vision of uh, how far we have to go. So our focus today, um, dear friends and colleagues, is on healing, healing ourselves and our communities. And I want to come at this from uh, my, the perspective of, of my project and the, the issues that I've been thinking about over the last 10 years. Uh, and many of you are familiar with my work, and to those of you who are hearing my story 
for the umpteenth time, I do apologize. Uh, but for the last decade now, I've been involved in a project here at Northeastern uh, attempting to address the harms of the criminal justice system from the Jim Crow era. And you might well say to yourself, well, the Jim Crow era, isn't that really yesterday's war? Don't we have enough to think about today in terms of inequities in our system? Why are we looking back that far? And our project uh, takes the perspective that we have yet to fully reckon with the harms of that period. Uh, and that furthermore, until we do fully acknowledge and recognize, recognize acknowledge um, and count and account for those harms, we can't really move forward, nor can we really fully understand what it is we're confronting today. So we take the position that we need a historical perspective uh, in order to address today's um, threats to, to equal justice. And in that vein, uh, along with journal students in journalism and law here at the university, we have unearthed a thousand cases of uh, violence uh, that resulted in death um, across the Jim Crow South from 19, as uh, Judge Arlen suggested, from 19, Justice Arlen suggested from 1930 to 1970. Uh, we've taken apart each one of those cases and have met with the family members uh, in those um, situations, um, have met with the law enforcement officers in the communities uh, where these events took place. Uh, and we've tried to, uh, as we say, restore a measure of justice to those communities. Um, that could come in the form of uh, changing uh, incorrect uh, descriptions in legal documents, for example, death certificates or other legal documents about what actually transpired. It could come in the form of uh, creating a curriculum for um, students at the high school and the college level about the body of cases. Uh, it could come in the form of working uh, as we are doing in Birmingham, Alabama with the mayor and uh, the city council to develop truth and reconciliation processes uh, for, the, um, for, these, for these homicides. Now we focused on homicides and of course we all know that that doesn't constitute the full realm of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, racial violence. Uh, uh, of uh, racial violence and racial hatred during the Jim Crow period. Um, but death is different. Uh, and one uh, developing a project of this sort um, has to take account uh, um, you know, historical period uh, and has to figure out what the, what, what the measure will be of the project. And so for our project, uh, we are collecting, as I say, this evidence of racial, racially motivated homicides during um, this particular period of time and in this particular area of our country. Our work has been re replicated uh, in, in, um, in the south, um, southeast and southwest part portion of the state by a colleague who is recording the same kinds of events with respect to Mexican American, Mexican nationals and Mexican Americans um, and other projects have similarly taken up um, this work. So eventually we will have, as, we come, as these archives come together and they will come together at the end of next year, uh, we will have a large um, searchable database where family members and um, and academics and uh, community uh, researchers um, can look at the, at the scope and breadth of what Ida B. Wells termed the red record in our country. Of course, it includes lynching, but it includes as well large numbers of police killings. Now, so I say we need uh, this historical perspective in order adequately to address the threats to equal justice in our country today. And I, I want to give you, and, and I want to give you two examples of the the, the of, of of what we have found, and use these two examples to then probe the question: uh, How do we develop an effective uh, reparative uh, retrospective justice project in our country that does the work in more than a retail fashion? Our students can do a lot, uh, but uh, they. They, they graduate, 
uh, and, uh, and, and there's only so much we can do in order to uh, uncover this history, unearth this history, uh, dealing with it, figuring out how to deal with it and what, uh, what global remedies are necessary, not beyond the remedies that we're able to provide to family members um, is, uh, is something that we're now uh, grappling with and, 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 and thinking deeply about. So the two examples are these. Um, Jack McDevitt and I were in Birmingham, Alabama at the Civil Rights uh, Museum there in March of last year, right before COVID hit. Um, and we were working with uh, a group of family members who had lost their loved ones to police violence. Our students were able to uncover a history of police homicide in the city of Birmingham um, that uh, was uh, utterly um, unbelievable. Uh, during a, a 10 year period, 127 uh, uh, individuals were killed by the Birmingham police on the streets and in, the, in their homes in Birmingham. Now here's, here's the shocker. Of those 127 killings, or maybe not such a shocker, 123 of them were African-American. This in a city that is only 35 to 40% African-American. There were no white women killed, very few white men killed, and a few black women. The large, overwhelming 96% uh, of those uh, homicides were African-American men. That's my first example. The second is this. Um, I've also explored rape executions for African-American men who are charged with sexual assaults on white women. Uh, and that number, uh, as you all, as, as I'm sure you, you, you all under, uh, appreciate, um, it uh, again shows a huge um, disparity. A uh, <clears throat> criminal uh, criminologist by the name of Marvin Wolfgang studied this, um, <clears throat> this area, studied in this area and found um, that 89% of the individuals executed for rape between 1930 and 1974 were African-American men, 89%. All of them were from the Confederate or the border states. Those men faced a higher risk of false confession uh, and a higher risk of receiving the death penalty than anyone else, uh, than black men charged with other crimes and white men charged with similar crimes. Um, these are huge, they're historic, of course, um, but they represent huge disparities and huge harms in our criminal justice system. So what can we do about that? What, 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 what are the remedies? And why do we have to look to remedies? Well, we look to remedies on the, in the first place. We look to remedies because international human rights practice requires rigorous and official examination of systemic and systematic miscarriages of justice, even years after those files have been closed. Um, we also look to remedies that uh, have, to be, have to come outside of the criminal justice system because traditional review is not available for these historical crimes. And so some of the remedies that have been used across the country uh, <clears throat> are apologies, of course, truth commissions, monetary redress, uh, and, and, and exoneration, posthumous pardons and exoneration. Um, but as I say, uh, uh, at, as for projects like ours, uh, we're working at a retail level. And at some point, our country has to think about what the wholesale remedies actually are. If we're serious about this, we have to think about and devise the wholesale remedies for these harms. We won't be the first country to face this. In China, after the Cultural Revolution was over in 1970, uh, 1978, uh, the state agreed to review over a million judicial cases that had been adjudicated from 1949 to 1978. 
Of those million cases, 300,000 were redressed. Some remedy was provided for 300,000 individuals or their surviving family members. About 250,000 cases had been found to be wrongly, falsely, or incorrectly charged and sentenced. I'm not suggesting, my dear friends, that our system looks look at our system during the Jim Crow South looked anything like the Cultural Revolution in China. But what I am suggesting is that where massive remedies are necessary, uh, rem uh, uh, structures to effectuate those remedies can be found. A similar process took place um, in South Korea. Now, I was, as Rick said, I was once a judge and I understand that judges are reluctant to examine their own past practice because they fear that they will compromise their independence and their role as neutral enforcers of laws, good laws and bad laws alike if they get in the business of looking back at the past. And as I say, this can't be done on an individual basis, uh, but certainly some of the remedial um, initiatives that have come within the last 10 years point the way forward uh, to developing an appetite for grabbing onto these uh, problems, grabbing these problems and trying to develop the structures to resolve them, um, as well as the perhaps um, the methodologies with which they can be resolved. Now, I know that Rachel Rollins uh, came, uh, to, was a part of the convocation earlier, and that she and, um, uh, and the other prosecutors talked about how in the, within their offices, they have developed integrity review structures um, to checks and rechecks. Uh, and so uh, it, something of, of that sort uh, can be uh, developed around these historical um, historical injustices in order to remove the taint, uh, in order to historicize our understandings of modern criminal justice system, and in order to clarify the processes by which we've moved from uh, the, the, the lynching era uh, through the Jim Crow era through to mass incarceration. So we're doing, we're the, we're, the, we're the legal experts, we're the academics, we're doing the research. Once the research is available, once the files are available, and I hope in my new position in Washington, I'll have some role in making those files generally available, then we will turn to the question of broad remedies. Now, finally, on the question of remedies, you know, you might say, well, um, these were, as, as, I, as I have said, these were massive systems of injustice. Uh, and so we can't, you, well, uh, every case can't be remediated. Uh, I read um, somewhere recently um, that in California, they've introduced a Freedom to Walk Act. The Freedom to Walk Act was introduced because they recently found in California that although everyone jaywalks, a, diff, uh, a disparate uh, proportion of African-Americans uh, are arrested for jaywalking. People of color are, uh, pedestrians of color are cited at a higher, far higher rate than our white pedestrians for jaywalking. So we can't go back and correct every jaywalking case. But as I've said before, death is different. Death is different. Uh, my recommendation would be that with respect to every single one of those cases where an African-American was executed, executions that were ultimately de deemed to be uh, unconstitutional for the crime of rape, each, in each one of those cases, there should be a posthumous exoneration. That in all those Birmingham cases, there was 127 killings by the Birmingham police 123, 123% of, 103%, uh, 103 of, 123 of which African Americans, that in every single one of those cases, those family members should be identified and, uh, and reparations uh, should be uh, afforded to them. 
So, you know, it's on that scale um, that, uh, that these things uh, have to ultimately be worked out. It's a large undertaking, undertaking, but not so large that we shouldn't be able to handle it. And so with that, my, my dear friends, uh, I will turn it over to my, my colleagues and again, express my deep appreciation to the Ruffin Society for allowing me to come among friends uh, and to talk about what's, what's been on my mind and uh, the issues that I've been grappling with and, and the, next, the next phase of, of the work in which I've been involved for these many years. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Burnham for those uh, outstanding remarks. And now it's my pleasure to present our convocation facilitator, Christine Cole, the executive director of the Crime and Justice Institute, a division of Community Resources for Justice. As I mentioned last week, Christine is recognized as an authority and expert in criminal justice policy and management. She has engaged in safety and justice reform work with governments and international multilateral agencies in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the South Pacific. We are honored to have her join us today. Christine Cole. Thank you once again, Chief Ireland, for your generous introduction. Um, this is our third in the series of three sessions, and I just remain humbled and honored to serve as the moderator for these events. Thank you again. Um, each and every speaker in the Ruffin Society 2021 convocation has been extraordinary, and today's guests are certainly similarly impressive. As you heard from Professor Burnham, we, we have, um, we can go back before the Jim Crow era, I would say, and have centuries of, of pain and harm um, that continue to be carried and shared, and we need to do something about those things. Uh, as professionals in the criminal justice system, many carry that pain uh, themselves and are subjected to vicarious trauma simply by doing their jobs. Seeing the pain and the angst and the aftermath of crime Witnessing communities in crisis and shepherding survivors and witnesses through a system that often re-victimizes is not easy work and can often break one's spirit. Taking care of oneself um, as you work in these systems also helps take care of the community we serve. Today, we're going to talk about not only some of those harms that Professor Burnham shared with us, but also we'll talk about trauma and healing ourselves. We're gonna go a little differently today. I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists and then ask each of them to take about five minutes to explain their current position, uh, employment or place in life and, and call on, and also perspectives on trauma. And just so there are no surprises, I'll both introduce you and call on you to speak for this first time in alphabetical order. And that will be Dr. Anderson, followed by Judge Anderson, Director Jacobs, and Director Calibro. I'm gonna watch the time. Um, it's a little difficult for me to give you a head nod when we're not in the same room, so I'll wave my arm or something. And if you ignore me, I'll be a little bit more dramatic, um, which is far less elegant than I like to be, but we have um, a time schedule and we wanna honor everyone's time together. So following the comments from each of our panelists, we'll have a conversation among us uh, and during which the audience is invited to submit questions using the Q&A tool. Members of the audience, in addition to my introduction of our panelists, um, I implore you to look at their bios on the conv convocation website, explore them on the internet, because we'll find that we yet again have an amazing group of people. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the Ruffin Society and the members of our audience, let me extend a warm welcome and gratitude to all of our panelists for participating in this session today. And as I've come to say, you know, we would ordinarily have a round of applause. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Charles Anderson, 
who is currently president and CEO of Boston's Dimmick Health Center. For over 25 years, Dr. Anderson has served in a variety of roles in Boston's healthcare community, including co-founder and, uh, and health and wellness operating affiliate, affiliate, it's a mouthful, Dr. Anderson, at Exalt Care Capital Partners. He's been vice president of corporate and business development for Caritas Christi Healthcare System, which has become uh, Seward, and, and manager in the healthcare practices at Deloitte. Dr. Anderson serves on the boards of Cambridge College, the Boys and Girls Club of Boston, and on the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Welcome today, Dr. Anderson. Our next panelist is joining us from King County, Washington, Marcine Anderson. She currently serves as judge with the King County District Court, West Division, after being appointed in 2010 and is now elected. Judge Anderson is the first woman and the first Asian American to serve in that district. Judge Anderson previously worked as a prosecutor in King County and much to my surprise as I looked at her bio with the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority which I dare say might go back to her time at Suffolk University where she attended law school, or the connection anyway. Judge Anderson holds leadership positions in local and national professional organizations, including serving as vice president for programs with the National Asian Pacific America Bar Association Judicial Council. Thanks again for joining us um, virtually from Washington, uh, Washington State. Next up, we have Edward Jacobs. Ed serves as the Director of Grants and Sponsored Projects at the Plymouth County, Massachusetts District Attorney's Office and is a member of the faculty at Stonehill College. Mr. Jacob has 41 years experience in the youth justice and forensic mental health fields. Prior to joining the DA's office in 1998, he worked for 13 years as a probation officer supervising youth on probation and adults with behavioral health needs. He completed his clinical training for the Master of Clinical Social Work at McLean Hospital with a concentration on addictions and adolescent behavioral health. Mr. Jacobs presents about children and youth, initiatives to address their needs and trauma. Thanks, Ed. And finally, please meet William Calibro. William Calibro is an internationally recognized advocate speaker and technical assistance provider. His personal and for a very long time private journey as a trauma survivor is at the root of his work, raising awareness about the role trauma plays in communities and how others, particularly in leadership, can, can support recovery. In addition to sharing his story of courage, pain and healing, Mr. Calibro is the director of the Office of Youth and Trauma Services at the Boston, excuse me, Baltimore City Health Department. Baltimore, as you may know, is known as one of the more dangerous cities in the country, with homicide the leading cause of death for African American males between 15 and 24. The city's Office of Youth and Trauma has a mission to partner with Baltimore communities to prevent harm, promote resilience, and encourage healing. It's an impressive collection of, of folks. I'm eager to get into the conversation. Um, I've shared a little bit about your titles, but there's so much more to each of you. Um, starting with you, Dr. Anderson, could you take a few minutes to give us your perspectives on the subject, trauma, healing ourselves, react to Professor Burnham. Um, tell us a little bit more about you. Sure, first of all, I'd like to just start off and just thank you all for allowing me to participate uh, in this panel and to be part of this very important conversation. Uh, I really want to make sure that you all are very clear that I, that I appreciate that, especially I always look at these things and say how I end up in the room because uh, as someone who's in, in healthcare, uh, in a room where we're talking about this from the judicial system, how do these two pieces come together? And in this case, it's really very obvious to me. Uh, so this is one of those times coming to the room and I say, okay, this makes a tremendous amount of sense. And let me start with just, I know I have five minutes to tell you a little bit about what I do and what the Demick Center does. Um, those of you who don't know much about the federally qualified health center movement, this is a movement that was started in the mid 60s 
And the Demick Center is one of these 1,400 community health centers across the United States, serving roughly 30 million people. Uh, and those 30 million people that we serve are primarily in low income, black and brown communities. So understanding that, and as we're starting to look at how these pieces come together, let me just give you a sense of what happens in my world on a regular basis. We actually have on our campus, and we have a nine acre, nine acre campus in the middle of Roxbury. Roxbury is for you know, the non-technical term is the hood, right? We've got black and brown community here, largely uh, poor community, but we're here serving over 19,000 people um, in terms of looking at the panel of the patients that we serve out of our nine buildings on this nine acre campus. Now, the whole community health center movement really was about this interface between social justice and healthcare, right? This was a movement started by Dr. Jack Geiger and then Ted, Senator Ted Kennedy to think about ways to provide healthcare for communities, as I described, where just a stethoscope and antibiotics were not gonna be enough. It was really about dealing with social determinants before we even called them social determinants. And that's what we're here to do. So on our campus, not only do we do the basics of primary care, we have a whole integrated program that integrates mental health and behavioral health in those visits. Now, what does that look like? If you walk into the, the, uh, the waiting room of our adult medicine clinic, one out of three people there can be there for medical assisted treatment for their substance use disorder. They can be there to see a mental health professional for their anxiety, depression, whatever it may be. Um, and then there's two out of those three people that are there for primary care. In that same building, we're connecting them with a whole host of other services, including dental, eye, and all those other sorts of things. But on our campus, we also have one of the largest, pretty much one of the only on a federally qualified health center campus, integrated full spectrum of uh, substance use disorder programming. That's detox, clinical stabilization, residential homes. And also on our campus, we have early education, including Head Start, early Head Start. So you really get this sense of this holistic environment that's designed to really treat the entirety of every one of those 19,000 individuals that land on our campus. So how does this all come together? I'll tell you a specific story about one of the residential homes we have on our campus. It is actually a residential home for men who are in recovery and they also have a mental health diagnosis. Probably about half of those men who are part of that program are also individuals who ended up there through the judicial system. They've experienced trauma in their life, and it's often that trauma in their life that puts them in the position where they are now. When you hear the stories of them going in and out of foster care as a young child, when you hear the stories of the abuse, when you hear the stories about you know, dealing with the violence that they've seen and reminded of the fact that, you know, in a study in 2009, over 60% of people under the age of 18 witnessed some real significant um, uh, trauma in their past 12 months. That's what they've dealt with, which puts them in a judicial system very often and often puts them in positions where they're living on the street um, as they are two miles from here at a place called Massachusetts Avenue and Malia Cass. Uh, where they're living there in uh, tents and they are you know, battling substance use disorder and mental health. And now imagine we take them out, we try to put them into a place where we're trying to assist them. If they find themselves in a courtroom that doesn't recognize that trauma and the importance that that trauma plays in their life and the life of those around them, we're not able to fully meet their needs. So I look forward to the ongoing conversation but at least want to give you that sense of where I sit, I'm seeing it from the perspective of trying to really at the downstream impact and trying to relieve the pain and suffering that has occurred through trauma. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Anderson. Let's move to um, Judge Anderson. I understand no relation, right? <laughs> I bet if we went through uh, some uh, DNA analysis, which we would probably find some cousins way, way, way back. <laughs> 
Thank you. And I want to thank the Ruffin Society for inviting me to join you today. And with special thanks to Chief Justice uh, Ireland and Professor Robert Ward, uh, who I knew when I lived in Massachusetts a lifetime ago. It is an absolute pleasure to be here today with all of you. Uh, I wanted to frame the issue from a different perspective, that of someone who is on the bench and who has an experience involving the trauma that Dr. Anderson described from an individual in, in his, uh, in his uh, workplace. First of all, what we know as people of color, one study found that we spend up to 80% of our time just navigating the world, ourselves, our children, our families, uh, uh, from that perspective, from being a person of color. This circumstance compounds secondary trauma, and I'm gonna to get to a definition of what secondary trauma is. But more and more, uh, and especially in the legal profession, I, I would say that the medical profession is about 30 years ahead of the legal profession in addressing secondary trauma, uh, but it's becoming a bigger issue in the legal system and uh, in the profession. In a September 15th, 2021 article in the National Judicial College, one of your other keynote speakers, uh, Chief Justice Kimberly Budd, quoted Chief Just, former Chief Justice Gantz, who said, quote, we are all interconnected. We are all part of the same team and the success or failure of one affects us all. And I really, really believe that. I believe that we have to have health, not only from the judiciary, but also for the people that are appearing in front of us, including the lawyers and in our courtrooms as well, whether it's the jurors, uh, our staff members, witnesses, people who are uh, in court for any particular reason. Uh, nearly half of all judges who participated in a National Judicial College survey indicated that they have suffered from secondary traumatic stress. In an October 20th, 2017 uh, article, one judge commented, quote, I will be out running and suddenly I see the burned off face of a five-year-old in my head and it won't go away, end quote. I want you to know that I've had a similar experience which made me start exploring secondary trauma and how it impacts everybody in the courtroom. I've been a judge since 2010, and this experience probably happened at least five or six years into being on the bench. Um, I've been a lawyer for uh, many years, since 1985. Uh, and so I've had lots of uh, experiences seeing group gruesome or traumatic or scary things. But um, I was on a calendar, it's called our Felony First Appearance Calendar, and it's a very simple calendar. All you have to do is determine probable cause of whether a crime occurred and also conditions of release. It's a very fast paced calendar. You usually get three paragraphs of information in a probable cause statement. Uh, and this calendar includes all the violent crimes in King County from the prior day. And so it is rapes and murders and a, a, a serious, horrible assaults. And so it's not, and I did this calendar regularly, so it's not like it was my first day on the calendar and I was shocked by this. But um, uh, I uh, read through this probable cause statement and for months could not get this, in, uh, this vision out of my mind. And so uh, I don't wanna give you secondary trauma, but I do wanna explain to you what it was. So a mom had been at a bar. And uh, at closing time, she asked these two guys for a ride home. They took her home and uh, one, of the dry, one of the people in the car, I don't remember who it was, uh, asked if they could stay at her house. And she said, yes. Little did she know that one of her house guests was an unregistered sex offender. And that night he crept into the bedroom of her 10 year old daughter and raped her repeatedly. The next day, the mom gave the defendant a ride home placing him in the back seat of the car with her 10 year old daughter. The child's statement in the police report was, I saw the face of evil that day. And then there's more. Uh, a week later, this unregistered sex offender followed the little girl home from school and was attempting to break into the apartment when the mom came home unexpectedly and prevented the break in. And then that's when the little girl told her mom and everybody about what had happened a few weeks earlier. 
Upon examination, it was discovered that she had contracted every uh, sexually transmitted disease imaginable. She was 10 years old. She'd never had a sexual experience before she was raped. And again, I don't tell you all this to give you folks secondary trauma, but it's just in those three short paragraphs on that probable cause statement and, and with that brief fact pattern, I could not get it out of my mind. So I was wondering, now, what is it about me? I have an undergraduate degree in social work, but what is it about me that makes it so I can't handle just this one fact pattern when I can handle murders and rapes and serious assaults? So uh, I started looking into it and I'd learned that secondary trauma is emotional distress that's caused about hearing about the firsthand trauma experience of another. And this uh, experience has been called vicarious traumatization and its symptoms mimic those of post-traumatic stress disorders, PTSD, and they uh, include symptoms of being afraid, having difficulty sleeping, having images of the stressful event, and avoidance. I'm almost done here. I just, I just, I wanted to frame the issue here. And so burnout is related and it's a psychological symptom of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. Secondary trauma, as I said earlier, affects everybody in my courtroom, our clerks, our bailiffs, our witnesses, the attorneys, and of course, the judges. So uh, how did I sort of uh, get myself to a place where uh, I wasn't thinking about this all the time and I can now talk about it without sort of getting emotional about it is I chaired a panel at the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association National Conference on this particular topic. And one of our panelists was a psychiatrist who teaches judges at the National Judicial College. And I had the privilege of asking her why I couldn't get this fact pattern out of my brain. And here's what she thought. First, the 10 year old girl went to the same school that my son had gone to years earlier. And so I had that emotional, personal connection to it. And one of the things I couldn't figure out was, was I mad about the mom for bringing home those guys? Or was I upset about the, the guy who had, had raped? You know, I couldn't figure out which one was affecting me more. And she said, basically what your brain does, and when you have that sort of personal connection to that location, as I, it brings out the mama bear in people. And so uh, because of that emotional relationship to the school that my son attended uh, and that my son and that this little girl went to the same school, uh, that created that sort of significant point where uh, this particular case impacted me. Um, and I have lots more to talk about on this, but I just wanted to frame the issue from uh, where a judge sits. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I think we're going to have the opportunity to talk more, a lot more about vicarious trauma. Thank you for putting it on the table so eloquently. And let's go to you. Tell us a little bit about where you're at in your profession relative to this topic while you get off mute. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, well, I appreciate being here. It's a real honor and a privilege of Justice Ireland, Attorney Ward, uh, uh, Justice Anderson, Dr. Anderson, and uh, Mr. Killebrew, I appreciate being here. And also, I want to thank Mr. Gittins, who's a, he and I have known each other for a number of years. So, uh, my name is Ed Jacobs, and I have been uh, some now a semi retired uh, state employee. I work part time for uh, the district attorney's office in Plymouth and Worcester. I try to do, we do programming, try to bring prevention activities into the community. And I also work for a, a training firm called. Uh, Operation to Save Lives, which I, I will talk about just briefly. Um, so my work goes back to, uh, the, what I wanted to talk to you about was my work goes back to uh, a phone call that I, well, I, I got a phone call from a, uh, I'm at the DA's office and I've been a probation officer and I was at the DA's office with Mike Sullivan and he said, gee, I have, you know, we got 50 lawyers, we put people in jail probation, but we have nobody on the front end. Are you interested in this? And this was 23 years ago and I left probation. And I went to see Mike Sullivan. And when I got there, I looked around the community and I said, okay, so where's the plan and how we're going to address youth victimization, youth violence, gun violence. This is after, you know, this is now 98. So this is that, that 85 to 95 surge of, of uh, youth and uh, violence that we had was was waning, but it, we had, you know, we were still in uh, shock from it. And uh, what became clear to me was that we needed to find a plan and there wasn't one. And, and then we began, 
began to think about what were some of the things that I had experienced in my time as a probation officer. And before that, when I was a, I ran a detention center for the Department of Youth Services and, uh, and uh, spent a number of years, seven years there. And, and I learned a lot about kids. I saw rage in kids that were 130 pounds. It took three people my size to try to contain and protect. And I kept thinking, this is not what I learned in undergrad. Um, so as we started to move into 2000, we started to hear about um, children who were at school and particularly uh, children who were, we were starting to really think about kids who were being suspended and try to work with schools and saying, you know, why are the suspension so high, et cetera. We had an armed home invasion in the city of Brockton and I got a phone call about from the school adjustment counselor, a mother, three kids, 12 year old son, five and six year old boy and girl. Uh, it was a drug house rip off one set of drug dealers was ripping off another, except they got the wrong house and they got this family. Uh, doors knocked off the hinges, they're masked, they're armed. Mother gets a gun in her mouth, she gets pistol whipped. It's a horrible nightmare. By the time the police come, they, they get them out, they take them to the emergency room. Uh, they bring them back at three in the morning and at three in the morning, they try to, she tries to tape up the door, God love her. Um, I got a phone call from the school two days later because they said the next day the children had come to school and they had come on time and they came hand in hand. And as, the, as, as this mentor of mine said, Eddie, not one of us in this school had any idea what had happened to those children. How are we to help them if we don't know? So I wanted to find out if this is like once in a while, once a month, twice a month, how many times. I also want to look at best practices. I want to, I want to give kudos to Betsy McAllister Groves out of Boston Medical Center, who's done some amazing work and really, really helped us in those early years. We looked at police reports from Brockton where children were mentioned in a police report uh, and there was a violent offense that took place. So we're mainly looking at community violence and domestic violence. And that first year we saw 800 incidences where children were present in a police report where a violent offense took place. Did some focus group with some uh, police officers. And one of the things that became clear was that they would say, well, we don't always put the kids in the police report for a number of reasons, which we won't go into now, but we needed to do more training. So we trained all those police officers again, and we've trained about 15,000 individuals, both teachers and, and uh, police officers. That second year, we documented 1,400 incidences of children being present. So we needed to try to figure out how do we, first of all, can we share information between police and schools and, and vice versa? How do you do that? How do you do it without breaking confidentiality? How do, and then what was the, what was the next piece? What was the third leg of the stool? And to that, I would give credit to the folks at the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative out of Mass Advocates and Harvard Law School, who um, wrote a book called Helping Traumatized Children Learn in 2005. We then, we had been working on the idea of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. We wanted to put that dead center in the middle of our prevention strategy. So TLPI strategy, if you don't know it, it's a whole school approach. When I had gone to schools before, I had um, talked to the principal or vice principal and they say, oh yeah, we have two people and they're now trained and they take care of all our trauma kids. And I said, well, how many kids do you have in the school? And they'll say 900. I said, how are we gonna handle, how are you gonna handle that? So what we loved about TLPI became the third leg of our stool was we wanted to get the whole school. So we do trainings. I've done uh, hundreds of trainings where we do uh, faculty, staff, support staff, cafeteria workers, janitors, bus drivers. We need everyone to have eyes on children so that we can be preventative. Right? There's a lot more to talk about, but I'm looking at my watch and I'm seeing I went over the five minutes, Ms. Cole. How'd I do? All right. I hope. You're pretty good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, we'll talk about some of those, those things you've just raised, trauma and behavior, trauma and responders, sharing information. Um, William, welcome. Thank you for being here. You have, um, you've, you've, you've been talking about trauma, you've lived trauma, you've survived trauma. Share with us some of the work that you're doing uh, to help, help round out this panel, and then we will have a conversation among us. Yeah, thank you, Director Cole, um, and to, uh, to our um, esteemed panelists, um, my colleagues, and uh, Professor Ward, thank you so much for the amazing invitation. Um, again, I, I, I think I echo Dr. Anderson that 
how do we end up in this room together this way is so important and special. Um, and to you, Judge Ireland and uh, Judge Burnham, thank you so much for laying uh, the groundwork for us. Um, I think I'll try to be as uh, quickly, as quick as possible so that we can move the discussion forward. Um, awesome, awesome, okay. Well, uh, don't do that, no, just joking. So we'll have, uh, we, I have uh, sort of two directions here. One is, um, one is personal um, um, reflection as well as um, a professional uh, reflection of the, of the work and description of the work that I'm doing here um, in Baltimore City. Um, and I'll, I'll just first say that um, as a child, I experienced um, um, childhood trauma. Um, I uh, witnessed the murders of my um, family members in our, in our family living room at the age of 10 years old. Uh, and what that did to uh, me and my family uh, was it devastated us in terms of our development as children in school. I devastated my grandmother. She was her only uh, daughter. Uh, she had to go to work. So thinking about every day, her being at work and uh, grappling with taking care of, care of a second generation, and sometimes a really third generation because she was a big aunt to my aunts. And so um, she was raising a couple of generations. And so thinking about the impact that it had on our family, but as an individual, me, um, I, 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 I grapple with my teenage life um, through uh, suicidal ideation, um, having uh, therapy, um, you know, going through a lot of um, healing. And that journey was a very tough journey. Um, but I'll fast forward in terms of my, my um, experience to how I really got involved in the field was that another experience happened where another one of my close, uh, close God sisters were, was murdered in, in the city in Washington, D.C., where I, where I was born and raised. And it really ignited me uh, inside and said that, you know, we've got to do something about this. And, um, and so I started to really address this from a different perspective, community organizing. And so I um, ended up going back to college and, um, um, you know, graduating uh, with a business degree, but really feeling a, a sense that there was more I could do around victim services and victimization. And so what I did was that I um, eventually uh, I joined the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care and trained over a decade with that team to deliver um, some technical assistance and training across not just our country, but in different parts of the world uh, to not only train on what is trauma, but what can systems do to be able to implement a trauma-informed approach. Now, we often hear that term trauma-informed approach, uh, but what does it really mean? Going back to um, um, Judge Anderson, uh, really, what, what, what are we talking about in terms of the definition? So shared language and understanding what is trauma is very important in terms of being able to identify the symptoms or the warning signs um, of traumatic reminders that happen um, every day uh, for people who are experienced it, but not just into anybody, right? We're talking about professionals, people who are involved in the systems. And while it's very interesting, um, um, we can go system to system all across the city or the country, um, but um, oftentimes we're serving the same person in different systems and they come to all of us in one uh, as one person, but what are we doing in our systems to be able to connect and be on the same page about how do we actually respond to those who are engaging in our systems and our services, whether we're at uh, juvenile justice, whether we're at a just, whether they are in criminal justice system or judiciary, where it, wherever it might be. Um, and so what we're doing in Baltimore City, um, I started in Baltimore City about five and a half years ago um, with the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, which is now the Office of Youth and Trauma Services. And while we have many programs that have shifted um, to being from the forefront of violence prevention to going upstream um, uh, to, to really think about how do we address trauma um, at the individual level, we're also working in systems. And so we hope to pass some legislation called the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act. Uh, Congressman Cummings was a uh, staunch advocate for addressing trauma. In fact, he invited me to speak um, in the first oversight um, hearing uh, oversight committee um, on uh, childhood trauma. And so being a part of that uh, movement um, on, on the Hill was, was very inspiring for me. And it continued to, 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 to really inspire me to do a lot of work on the, on the local level. And so we, we, we passed the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act after he uh, passed away. And what it did was establish a task force in the city to look at trauma um, and also it established um, that we would have some required training for all 14,000 employees um, to be able to understand trauma, 
understand what is trauma, but also to be able to implement programs and services that uh, were trauma informed, uh, that were trauma sensitive and uh, culturally competent or a uh, sensitive, culturally sensitive, if you will. And that also um, that valued um, trauma specific um, services and treatment. So what we're doing now is uh, we are piloting in the library system. And so we realize that librarians and security and staff um, are just one agency at the front line of engaging um, um, residents and each other, by the way. Um, so lastly, I'll say that that work is continuing today. We've not only trained uh, every agency head in the entire city, including the mayor and all cabinet members, but we've also trained the city council and all of their staff. We've trained uh, the media in our city because we realize that the messaging that happens in community um, oftentimes can be traumatizing for individuals who've experienced victimization or crimes. Um, you know, for instance, uh, some 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 victims have a real challenge with juxtaposing a person who's responsible for or alleged responsibility for a crime with a victim and sort of putting them into play. So sometimes that can be very traumatizing for a victim. So having those types of considerations or um, my example, um, the media said in my own case, 10 years later, I went to the library and, and went through the microfiche, by the way, and I, I wanted to know what happened back then in, in my life. And when I looked at the article that the, that the um, author wrote, uh, it said that a little boy named William, they were talking about me, uh, survived. Um, um, he was released, but he was unhurt. And just that statement right there alone was probably what the author did not intend to do. But here it was that I was reading a, a passage that invalidated uh, me as a person and invalidated my experience. And so what we're doing in Baltimore City is really looking at that, how we can validate this, the, 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 validate the experiences of an entire city's pain. And we know that, um, as Dr. Burnham, um, Judge Burnham talked about, that there are um, years of um, 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 structural oppression and injustice and racism in the policies, 19, 1912 uh, segregation laws, uh, redlining. And so not only uh, are we uh, grappling with uh, the individual trauma and the um, bullying and the school, school uh, uh, the collective trauma, but we're also looking at the historical trauma and the intergenerational impact that it has on not just the residents, but also the people that work and engage to serve them on a daily basis. And so th that's, that's a blip of the work that we're doing in Baltimore City. I look forward to more of the conversation. Great, thanks. I'm going to invite all of you to take yourselves off mute so that we can mimic reality a little bit better and feel free to sort of jump in and interrupt. Um, uh, once again, I'll just make a plea to the audience that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we will, we will get to your, your questions. You know, the, just hearing about the, the overlap and the differences in your work and your perspective raises for me a whole host of questions. Um, Judge Anderson, you, you, it, among your remarks, you said the legal profession is probably three decades behind the medical profession in terms of recognizing the trauma of what I'll call responders or system actors, the vicarious trauma. Um, you know, it's foolish to say, where do we start to fix that? Because we have to do all of these things at the same time. But what kinds of things have, have you been working on to help build that awareness? And I invite others to chime in, particularly for the medical field. If, you, if you're if you seeing folks who are system actors, and I mean the professionals, you know, seeking help. Um, that's one of the things that I think is really important that if we're not taking care of ourselves, it's really difficult to take care of people who need help. And in response to that, I think it's really important for individuals who have this exposure to secondary trauma or vicarious trauma to learn how to take care of themselves. I would say that I, I if I read the literature, med the medical profession has, has really got a really good handle on this. The legal profession, I think lawyers have a certain swagger that they think that this doesn't affect them or it, it shouldn't affect them or it won't affect them. And, and so uh, I think that people just really need to understand that it's out there. What I know is um, I've given training uh, on this topic. I know that when we've had judicial conferences, it is now 
at least once a year a topic for discussion uh, at the judicial conferences. But I think panels like this, where we talk about all angles of, of, of how trauma occurs, is really important. Dr. Anderson, in your practice, yeah, please jump in. I know it's funny you say the healthcare system is further ahead. It's very few things where healthcare is ahead of anybody. <laughs> I just realized, just put it that way. Uh, but I do think part of why uh, healthcare at least has the perception of being further ahead is because of the way care is structured to involve individuals who have that sensitivity, right? So we've got my clinical background was in newborn intensive care unit, right? You talk about people entering a situation with trauma, right? You know, families who have for you know years have been working to try to have a baby and then get to that point where they're only told that their baby is going to be born and weigh three pounds, two ounces and be in the NICU. And, you know, they have this vision of tubes all over and they walk in and that's what they see. And, and, and that's their experience. And by having that team of social workers and nurses and others who are sensitive to that, will even take that neonatologist who might not have had that particular training, it actually constantly reminds us as neonatologists uh, to actually think about the trauma that our patients and families have gone through to get that point. So I think it's just because it's ingrained in what we do. And by the way, I was the dad on the other end of that situation with the three pound, two ounce baby. So I saw it also from that standpoint of someone who's traumatized and benefited from the fact that there was a system where there was nurses and social workers and others who were able as part of what they do to do that inventory of trauma, not necessarily calling it that, but by capturing that fullness of who that person was as they're coming into the environment. And that's probably the main reason why we, and again, and that happens in our practice every day. And we are using tools like ACES, by the way. The stories that you told Ed and William, your, your personal story, and you think about how important it is for schools to understand what kids have been going through. And, um, and I, I wonder about the, the different ways that we are helping actors in schools, but as, as Dr. Anderson talked about, people in the medical profession sort of are attuned to the trauma. How are, where are we in making a difference um, with providers? Um, I'll go first to you, Ed, because I saw William, there was a question put to you in the, the chat that I saw you answered, but I also would like to have it shared with the whole audience, which is about um, what kind of impacts have you noticed with with social and economic impacts in Baltimore with increased conversation about trauma-informed care. So, Ed, what, are we better off now than we were 30 years ago? What's going on? Uh, I'd like to think we are. I mean, I, I, thought this, I thought the system was broke for a long time. I still think it needs a lot of repair. Um, but I think, um, I think we're, we're at least, we have people pushing in the right direction and asking the right questions. And the 800 pound gorilla is now exposed, I think. Um, what we're trying to do is really get uh, messages to teachers. And so sometimes we use maps of, hey, this is your community. And by the way, this is where shots, fires happen. This is where domestic violence happens. This is where overdoses have happened, et cetera. And by the way, here are your schools. And every time I do that, and I've done it in a lot of communities, um, they'll, I have two, three people come up to me and say, you know, I've been in this community for 20 years. I come here every morning at 7.30. I leave every afternoon at 4.15. I knew it was a tough neighborhood. I didn't know what this was going on. And that can be in some kind, even in the affluent areas, but in, in terms of our urban areas. So teachers, I think, are changing um, the way they're looking at kids. Again, we're trying to get them to go from, you know, what's wrong with you to, you know, what happened to you. We took a quick, uh, we took a look at the, some schools that we did. We took three at random about three or four years ago. We probably need to do it again. We've trained uh, hundreds of schools so far, but we took a look at three at random and saw that there was a 70 pre and post of the training after a year, there was a 70% decrease in suspendable offenses and a 43% decrease in office referrals. And I actually thought it'd be the other way around. And I, we, we had a focus group with some teachers and I said, so what do you think of these numbers? 
And they came back and they said to me, well, I said, I thought it'd be the other way around. They said, no, no, no. Now when we send them to the office, it's a warm handoff to get the child some assistance. It's not to get them suspended. So this has got, you know, the school to prison pipeline, we need to address that issue. That's what we need. That's one of the things we need to do. The second thing I will tell you is that I've seen as we do the training with police officers, raising their awareness about childhood trauma and ACEs, et cetera. And what do they do when they get to a scene and how can they handle, how can they handle children? I've had officers say to me, you know, I've been in the job a long time. When I get to a scene, it's a domestic or some kind of chaos. I quell the situation to the extent I can. I look in the corner and I got a five-year-old boy or girl sucking his thumb, rocking back and forth. I don't know what to do with that. I'm not a social worker. I want to say to them, yeah, you are, but that's a story for another day. But as we discuss the trauma and the nature of things and how, and how children develop with trauma and and some of the, the symptomology that may present itself and some of the behavior. I always have officers come over to me afterwards at a break and say, uh, you know, I don't want to tell you nothing, but uh, that was my childhood. And so I think if we're going to get officers, my opinion, to be more empathic, I think we need to put, put the cards on the table and say, this, is, this could be your life. This could have been your childhood. And if it is, how do we, how do we improve upon it? What, 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 do you, what could you add to that experience? What can you do for that child that one, you could be that one buffer, as we talked to them, you could be the buffer that changes that child's trajectory because you're at the time of the crisis, at the, at the, at the most, most critical time. And so that's something I think we need to do. We need to think about how police officers address the issue, but also to, to the judge's point about secondary trauma. Yeah, well, I don't really have it. It's not part of my job, et cetera, but they do. And we need to put it on the table. So we've been doing that by going through the uh, explaining them childhood trauma and then having them come to their own uh, aha moment. So two different kinds of training there. One, how to deal with somebody who's experiencing witnessed trauma and also um, helping people aware that, probably make people aware that they they have residual impact about their, their work. Yeah, we're, we're, we look at, we kind of look at it three ways. The first thing we want to do is raise awareness, get everybody understanding it, get it to be in buzz. The second thing is, can we prime the pump? Can we get some funding, grants, money, whatever, and kind of show best practices? What, what's working in Baltimore, let's say? I know, I don't know Mr. Killebrew. He's going to get a call from me tomorrow morning. He doesn't know it, but I'm calling him. And, you know, what are they doing in Baltimore? And then the last piece is, how do we then get that to policy or, or, or you know, or, or some kind of institutionalization? Uh, and I say that because I'm always afraid of that. My father used to say, you know what happens to young Turks who, tip over the apple cart, they become old Turks who say, get off your grass. So having said that, I understand that, but you know, sometimes we need to kind of make these, these practices, best practices that people are using, um, we need to make them more commonplace in the default setting rather than the exception. Mm. You know what, can I just add one other point here? Cause I think it's really important cause we're talking about two different things. They're related, but they're two different things. One is how we do trauma informed care right, to allow us to recognize the trauma that people are coming into situations with. The other question you're trying to get at is how do we actually deal with the secondary trauma and support our teams through that? And I think we can see through COVID, healthcare hasn't done that well on that one, right? I mean, there are, we, there's, there's no doubt about that. But let me give you what I think is an interesting back, best practice that I saw. When I was at Caritas Christi, now Stewart Healthcare, um, I reached out to an organization called the Kenneth B. Schwartz Center. And what the Schwartz Center does is they have this system of Schwartz rounds. So they come into hospitals and I invited them in and I think it still exists at St. Elizabeth's at least one of the hospitals. And what they do is they have this system that allows us to identify those challenging cases. And they typically are those where there's been some secondary trauma, although that's not what we called it right? Those cases that you take home and you're, you're thinking about that and what happened and it just, it weighs on you. And they allowed us to create these safe spaces to discuss these situations with the care team, uh, with the administration of the hospital, anyone could participate. And so it created that space where you were able to stand up and say, this is what happened to me, or no, this is what I saw. And this is the secondary trauma I experienced. Again, they didn't call it that, but it created a wonderful form. And this exists across hundreds of hospitals across the country. And I think they're even now doing this internationally. But that would be a good example of a best practice that might be looked at 
as you think about this in, in the judicial world. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. William, how long has um, there been a sort of a mindset of trauma-informed interventions and care in Baltimore? And has it been long enough period of time that you're, you're seeing differences in neighborhoods, the way individuals are being treated or, or their lives are changing? Well, I, I would say that the legislation that was passed on the, the, the Healing City Act, which we first call the Trauma-Informed Care Act, uh, was passed in February 2020. Uh, we know that um, Baltimore City is not the first city to sort of address this issue, but um, Baltimore touts, uh, you know, city council says that, you know, um, it's the first city to legislate this kind of comprehensive approach um, to have everybody trained in the entire city. Um, but so, so there's some nuance to the work we're doing, but there's been fragmented or segmented work that has been happening around the trauma-informed approach. For instance, what Ed talked about, there's a lot of trauma-informed care uh, um, per trainings that are going on in schools. Um, and in fact, one of the things that has been implemented in um, city schools is also restorative practices. Uh, they've worked closely with the Open Society Institute and they saw uh, some really, um, um, really good outcomes, if you will, um, with decreased suspensions or incidents, things like that. Uh, that were happening in the schools. Um, and so we saw that that was working in schools. And so we actually teamed up with OSI to, to do restorative practices in the city government now. And so libraries are gonna start with a deeper dive in terms of restorative practices, also mindfulness we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, but some people are not you know, uh, attuned to uh, uh, you know, mindfulness or restorative practices. And so there's gonna be a deeper dive in terms of understanding from beyond that, what uh, librarians or library staff want to um, focus on from their perspective, and then how can we get the clinicians to work and say, listen, I, I, that matches this particular model. Let's focus on this. Let's focus on that. Uh, but you know, we have different tiers. We look at this through the ecological model um, you know, um, lens where we're looking at policy as well, not just how we engage individuals and communities, uh, but also in families, but also what are we doing around policy? So the, the act really focuses on addressing the, the policies that are in place and changing those policies. Um, so for instance, the city also um, uh, passed a policy on um, equity. And so it placed an equity coordinator in every single agency. And for, from the health department's perspective, we have an internal agency uh, committee and an external committee that really focuses on what are the inequities that have happened inside the, 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 we're talking about how do employees begin to rise and say, this is what's happening here. How can we address this? But for external committee, we're really focusing on how do we drive inequity or, or drive equity uh, in the way that we use policies to engage our public. So in our public health perspective, thinking about how many contracts have gone to agencies that are majority agencies and smaller grassroots organizations have never seen a dollar in their lives from, from, the, from the institution or the structure, um, but also what's the makeup of those committees and those organizations that are joining us in terms of coalitions. So we're really digging deep in the city and we have a, um, I would say a, a, a tool, if you will, um, we, we stay away from the mandated language in trauma-informed care, but we have a tool to be able to use to begin to address the injustices that happen on a daily basis in, in our city. And so those are the kind of things that are happening in our city. Um, lastly, one of the questions that happened earlier um, was around the impact um, uh, to Baltimore City, city residents um, that led us to this decision around how we got to this you know, place of let's, let's make Baltimore trauma-informed city. Um, we know that 40% of adults in the city, according to uh, Behavioral Health System Baltimore, our Behavioral Health Authority, um, have experienced ACEs, and that's compared to 24% um, um, statewide, with homicides having, having been over 300 um, homicides for the past seven years, up to the past seven years now, we're grappling with a real challenge in terms of not just homicides, but the shootings that occur in the city. And so we're looking at those high risk situations. But I will say this, that seven to 10 individuals and family members are directly impacted by just one death, just by one homicide. So we're talking about a ripple effect in the city. So healing is something that we're really focusing on. And that's why the act was changed in its bill status from trauma-informed 
uh, uh, act, care act to a healing city act, because the result for us has to be healing, not trauma again. So we're really shifting the way that we think about this and, and looking at it through a public health lens and not just to rest our way out of it, not always look at high risk interval individuals, but the families and individuals and systems that have been harmed. And how do we how do we address that through many, many ways? And so we got a lot going on, everybody. That's that's mm. that's what's happening in our city. <laughs> It, it's really exciting to hear about the holistic perspective and how deep it is. You know, I, I hate to ask this question, but I but I have to because I feel like in so many quarters there's a cynic, there's a there's the naysayer. What's the pushback, if any? Are there groups of people that are resisting this this new philosophy or concept? And and if so, how are they being dealt with? Well, that's quite interesting because there are folks who believe that, um, I mean, you, you can go and listen to, you can listen to the news reports and look at it, right? And you'll hear somebody yelling from the background, interrupting the mayor as he's speaking about a swear, at the swearing in uh, party. So that means that they're not, a, the person who's yelling is not able really probably to really care about the fact that we're moving forward, but how do we address the inequities from the past and acknowledge those kinds of things? And it's what Judge Burnham was really talking about is saying before we even get to where we are today, there's mm -hmm. gotta be some type of acknowledgement of, of what's happened. So not that the mayor doesn't acknowledge it or anything like that, but there's a lot of pain from the past and it, right. and it on display. And so there's a heavy, there's a delicate balance right now that we play, because oftentimes bureaucratic systems and local government can be harmful just unintentionally. Because for instance, a lot of our grassroots organizations may not be able to um, afford the reimbursement funding that comes along with federal funding, right? So they have to do their work and put their, and they can't, they don't have money to put up front. Well, it takes sometimes, sometimes it takes a long time for contracts to get approved. And here it is for those systems, those folks waiting. And so they become also traumatized by the systems and it becomes a trust factor. We know that trust, Bessie McAllister Grove says, trust is the first casualty of early abuse. It goes out the window first. So if we're gonna build trust and build those building blocks, we're gonna to have to build a connection. And, it's, and I think it really starts with trust, trust in systems. And so, um, you know, we, we aren't responsible for anybody else's traumatic reminders, but what we probably are responsible for, arguably for some, um, is how we support individuals to be able to cope and be able to um, repair what has happened. We do have a responsibility and those are things that we can do from our perspective and our lens is to be able to repair the relationships with community members, with community leaders and show them the consistency and look, you know, we, we, we are part of the system, but we here are here to change and we're here to listen to you. And it really starts with that kind of trust building. So we do have a lot of people who are just not on board with it, but the, they're the voices of when, when we hear the voices of trauma survivors and families and youth, mm -hmm. that's what actually started this, this campaign was it was youth experienced a shooting in one of the high schools and they said no more. So they went to city council and they rallied, again, they rallied at city council and they said, we want change. And so those young people, just like those young people in the civil rights era, just like those young people in the Arab Spring as has been called, um, what happened in, in those in those where young people oftentimes are at the forefront of change. And that's what happened in our city. That's great. I mean, embedded in your remarks, there's um, there's a lesson for each of us that was an individual even, which is to work to restore trust. Mm -hmm. Right. At, that's a starting place. And there's a message yeah. there for something each one of us can take away. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, Judge Anderson, sort of following on what William said, I mean, what kind of practice changes have you seen in the courts that that work to to consider or, or respond to a trauma-informed response to people that you meet. Is that something that's happening in the courts in King County? I don't know that it, I would call it a response to trauma-informed needs, but one of the things that our court is doing is we have community court. And community court is, a, a, we have a special day set aside for people who have sort of just uh, low-level crimes, shoplifting, uh, uh, criminal trespass, which is just sort of hanging out in a doorway or uh, sleeping in a, in a building that's vacate, uh, that's vacant, 
uh, and we have a calendar where we have those kinds of cases where uh, people can come in uh, and, and if they do certain things like some hours of community service restorative to the community, uh, if they broke something or stole something, restitution for whatever it is that they stole, whether it's from a pineapple or a bottle of whiskey or something, restitution for that. And then if they do the things timely and they participate fully in uh, that, whatever it is that they've agreed to in their community court contract, then what they've done is they get their cases dismissed. And I think from the standpoint of trust, uh, that Mr. Kilbrew talked about, it does, it's baby steps right now because we've only had our community court since January before the pandemic started. Uh, and uh, and uh, we're on Zoom now for, for the most part on community court because most of the people that are participants don't have the technology to uh, 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 Zoom in or, I mean, they come into court sometimes but they don't always have the technology. But so baby steps on, on getting sort of the con connections between the community and the people that uh, allegedly have done harm to the community. And, and I think that what Mr. Kilbrew says about you know increasing trust is so very important. We can't get to the next conversation. No, not if, at all. If there isn't trust. Um, uh, Christine, I had a comment also um, yes. uh, uh, to talk about um, some of the work that uh, when, when I uh, previously did, previous to the uh, Baltimore City Health Department, um, and I came to Baltimore by way of that, that National Center for Trauma-Informed Care, uh, which is a substance abuse and mental health services agency training and technical assistance center. Um, so one of the things that we had created was um, a judicial trauma-informed care guidance, right, guide. And it was amazing. And I, we can, I could send that out to anybody who need, who wants to see that. Uh, but we worked uh, real closely with Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Judge Marsh Hirsch um, in Queens, in the Queens courts. And she, um, you know, I, I used to often visit her in the court to watch um, how she implemented trauma-informed practices. So for an example, one of the things that uh, she would do is, uh, you know, in her review in her uh, chambers, we would simply just uh, review the cases and we would pick out the one that probably had the best the best outcome, the best results, right? And she was over drug court, domestic violence and veterans court, veteran courts. Um, and so we would start the court case and she would start with the best case, uh, most, you know, the most probably positive outcome. And she would start that case and she would say, Mr. So-and-so, you know, you, um, you, you, you got through your, your, um, your program and here's your big certificate and everybody in the entire courtroom would clap and she would allow the bailiffs, everybody would clap and celebrate that kind of outcome. And, um, and, and then he said, well, thank you very much. And the judge dismissed him, but then she calls him back. She said, oh, well, there's one more thing. And he got very nervous as he turned back. And she says, you forgot your certificate. <laughs> it was like, thank you so much, judge. But what that did that I recognized that it, it really set the tone for uh, that courtroom and the anxiety that comes with facing the judge. Because we know uh, Dr. Richard Malika talks about in his book, Healing Invisible Wounds, that, that, that there's a humiliation behind every act of violence. So we know that the individuals are coming in our courtrooms, are coming in our coming in our programs, have already faced humiliation on a daily basis because of uh, you know whether it be uh, um, substance use or what have you. Um, there's a lot of embarrassment, shame, and guilt, and and all those feelings. So really addressing those feelings at the core is, is something important uh, for Doctor um, for Judge Hirsch. I um, mean, you can see the immediate. Um, um, transformation of a courtroom by setting the tone in that way and building on strengths at the heart versus uh, versus building on uh, where well, there's no way to build on deficits, right? We build on strengths and that's at the heart of a trauma informed mm -hmm. approach, if you will. Dr. Anderson, were you trying to get in? Your, no, your screen just, went out. No, I no, was just uh, was just agreeing. I'm not sure what that was, uh, but uh, you know, just in, in strong agreement, this issue of trust is so critical um, and we see it in our world and we see the trauma and past trauma and how that impacts trust. Give you a perfect example. When we were trying to figure out how to get people vaccinated in our community, right? Great, great example right there of that trauma impacting trust and impacting us getting to a level of deliberations right, in a time frame, right? And I think what we found here in order to address a lot of this was how we really engage people. And, and fortunately, part of what community health centers have is at least that more of a, a more of a trusted relationship with the community. 
which is why you know so much of the vaccine was directed to community health centers and away from hospitals uh, because of that trust factor. And it, it's it's really really a, a critical critical part about this. And the one thing I will add, just as we talk about both these things, and I think we're all on the same page on this, but just I would be remiss if I didn't say it, is that when we talk about trauma-informed care, it, we have we can't exclude the secondary trauma care because that impacts how you show up to provide trauma-informed care, right? It, it, they're really so, so interwoven that as much as we think about these as separate, I think the more we start to look at a system that says this is all about dealing with individuals and their trauma, regardless of what part of the equation you're on, which gets to this whole soapbox I have about strengthening our mental health systems and all the rest of it, which I won't get into. But at the end of the day, that's part of what we're talking about here, whether it's secondary or primary trauma, do we have a system in place to allow us to manage, manage that and to deal with that? And, and one of the things that we, we actually train on is while we've identified that there is, uh, you know, some primary uh, and also secondary victims of trauma or secondary trauma, uh, we really don't make the distinction in our training. So we, we say that because the symptoms are often the same, how are we to know, right? That the key here that, that we talk about, you know, is that the event isn't the trauma. It's the fact that the event completely overwhelms our capacity to cope. It makes it. So some people may not be able to cope with the secondary quote unquote trauma of being able to hear or witness. And now we know that the DSM-5 DSM, um, actually supports witnessing violence can be as traumatic as someone who is a direct victim of violence. So whether you over, whether you hear it, whether you see it, whether, whether you experienced it intergenerationally, it, it, there, there's no distinction in that sense. But I think for the definition uh, for us in terms of uh, validating that there is some um, secondary trauma, if you will, with individuals who are serving and engaging, um, you know, in, in their in their workspace is a real thing to me. Uh, but but we 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 really validate it to to say that it can be as traumatic because the symptoms can be oftentimes you can't distinguish them at any rate. So how do we actually respond to that person in that system is 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 what really is at the heart of how how we will transform and actually begin the process of healing or or continue it even so so and then, and, then the, and then the will to build those systems to allow that to work as i look at the work that you do you know there's a and you might not know this but people who go into psychiatry part of their process is they're almost forced to have a therapist right well, just as I did. They just know from the beginning, this is what you're going to be dealing with. You just have to have a therapist in order to get out of your residency program. That's just how it works. Um, you know, that maybe that's what we should be thinking about. There's certain lines of work where, you know, if you're a nurse in an ICU, you have to have a therapist. <laughs> we have to destigmatize it and all the rest of that. But that's part. And then we have to have enough therapists. Of course, that's a whole other issue. But but that's the reality. With a competent understanding about this this workforce, right? That whether Correct. you're a, a, a NICU nurse or a police officer on the streets of Baltimore, um, let's talk about that a little bit more. It was several years ago I did a focus group of police officers in Baltimore City, and I remember walking away from that group thinking these people are traumatized. They all talked about the calls for service they had about the deaths of young men on the street, about um, the, the, they didn't use the word fear, but but you felt that. Um, and I, I'm gonna turn to Marcin, um, excuse me, Judge Anderson, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and Ed too, because you alluded to this earlier. Um, you've talked about, I know that you've done some, a little bit of work, you've talked about it with us, about this, this kind of compassion fatigue. And I know it's something that I experienced. I worked as a victim advocate uh, in a prosecutor's office here in Massachusetts and laughed af left after about a decade. I didn't call it compassion fatigue, but I know that's what it was now. And I left there over 25 years ago um, and I've had a, a, a number of different experiences, but I think it's really real. And when you think about how people who are system actors sort of take care of each other and the behaviors in which we engage, which aren't always safe and productive, I think are really important. Um, Judge, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? And Ed, if that touches on some of what you were, you're sharing, I'd love to hear from you too. So yeah, one of the things that I heard 
uh, Mr. Jacobs say was, it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And I just happened to be reading this book, which is uh, not so much, it's Oprah, but it's also a Dr. Bruce Perry, which I am completely fascinated by how our brains work and how we get to where we are because of the work that our brain does and doesn't do to protect us. And so Oprah, the Oprah piece is written in blue. The doctor's piece is written in black. She raises, she kind of has some personal stuff, but he keeps coming back to a model about how our brains are designed to um, uh, help us get through really traumatic events. I think that the one thing, we all know that sort of the symptom, symptoms of, of compassion fatigue or secondary stress are things that, things that go on with our bodies, whether it's, uh, uh, high blood pressure, uh, aches and pains, um, exhaustion, uh, things that uh, you kind of like, oh, I just don't feel right. And, and that's some of the things that go on with your body. Um, but I think that the way to get around all this is to grow resiliency uh, among uh, anybody who is doing this kind of work, whether it's law enforcement or the librarian. I just, I had not even thought of librarians before, but it's law enforcement or the librarians or uh, someone who just happens to see a child that doesn't look right. I, I think that um, the more that you experience this, I think you have to start developing resiliency in your own uh, life to make it so that you don't go into that dark place where there's a lot, of, and because I know this in the legal profession, it probably is in the medical profession or the helping professions as well. Really gallows humor, uh, not seeing human beings for, you know, not seeing a severed arm as a severed arm or, you know, just different things like that, that really um, uh, go to the, uh, the basis of that traumatic uh, uh, secondary traumatic stress is, is just sort of dehumanizing the people that you see on a regular basis. So resiliency is where uh, I really think uh, that is going to be the most helpful to any one of us. Uh, can I just ask a clarifying way? I just want to make sure I understand it. Are you saying the resiliency uh, comes from dehumanizing the situation? Oh, goodness, no. Okay, no, I, just, I, didn't, I didn't think that's what it was, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. No, right. no, no. The resiliency is what you do for yourself to make sure that you don't get into that place where you are. It, it's always about gallows humor or it's always about really serious stuff. And you're standing there laughing and joking about it because you just saw a severed arm or and, and it's funny and it's not funny. It's not funny at all. But some some way that's sometimes that's how our bodies and our brains uh, make it so that we can get past those experiences. You're right. And we see a lot of that in healthcare, right? When we talk about whether there's a lot of people who have bad experiences when they go to the ER or something like, and there's a lot of that way healthcare professionals get to that place of not developing or not having the tools and the support to, 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 to build some degree of resiliency and instead get to the point where there's certain things that should elicit a feeling and an emotion and they stop feeling that. I used to tell my nurses in the NICU all the time, if I got to the point where I was telling a family that we tried everything we could and their baby died and I didn't want to cry, then it was time for me to do something else, all right? You never want, in, my, in healthcare, I've always had work with students and residents, you don't want to lose that part of it. But to your point, what do you give them to protect them and to develop that resiliency along the way? That's an interesting criteria that you used. I'm sorry, Ed. That's a good criteria that you used. I want to point out, um, Judge Anderson, you shared with me a tool. Um, should I put that website in the chat for people to see? Sure. It's it's um it's uh it's called the Quality of Life or Professional Quality of Life uh, Scale, and it is going to show up here in just a second. It's a little self test that you can give yourself uh, and then uh, you just uh, give yourself a number rating and then uh, uh, the next page on the on it has you score what different numbers don't read the second page before you do the first page okay mm -hmm. read this read do the first page first and then uh, on the second page and I, it doesn't look like that's on there and but the second page has 
uh, what different questions scores should be. And then the third page is, is that which tells you your score. Oh, this, this right here is the second page, the one that's showing right now. Mm -hmm. And then the third page is the page that was above that. And it, it sort of gives you some um, ideas of where you are in terms of compassion, satisfaction, burnout, or secondary traumatic stress. And this is put together by a really interesting uh, group of people because it's uh, from the Center for Victims of Torture, but uh, they uh, have this, it's readily available online. Uh, and, it, and it's just a rough test and a rough guide for those of you that are a lot more, uh, a lot deeper into science and uh, medicine. It's probably uh, junk science, but to me, it was very helpful to at least start a conversation with people. And so we do have permission to use that and share it with you today. Thank you so much. Um, I, it's nice to have a tool. Yeah. Um, Ed, I stepped on you. I invited well, no, no, you to no. join and then I stepped on you. So jump in. No, I, I was gonna say one of the things I think that it leads, at least in my expression, uh, my, my opinion over the X number of years I've been around 40 plus is, um, you know, you have compassion, you have empathy for people, you, you, you see their plight, but when you're helpless to help them and you feel like you don't have tools in your toolbox and this is, that becomes a very, um, that becomes traumatizing in itself. It wears on you. It feels like you have no, there's nothing I can do. I, what, where am I, where am I, how am I supposed to help this child? My, my experience has been with kids and families. And so, you know, putting, that's why we, we talk about trying to put tools in teachers, uh, firefighters, where they, now they have us working with corrections officers, which is fine by me, police officers, et cetera, as well as faith-based. How can we put tools in their tool belt to understand um, what they're seeing and maybe something they can do? A, a quick example. Uh, we've been training police officers now for about three or four years on when they go to a scene and there's a child and they're having a difficult time. Some people call it tactical breathing. It's a, you know, it's the idea of kind of mindfulness, but it, some people call it box breathing, but we, the officers know it because they're used to using it in terms of their firearms training, they, being able to control their breath and control their heartbeat, et cetera, to use their, their weaponry, if you will. We're not asking them to do that. What we want them to do is get to the point where they can teach a child and maybe the parent at a scene, this is what I'm doing. They're almost giving them something of value and saying, you can use this whenever you feel like X, Y, Z. Um, we've had some pretty, really good results with that. Some feedback from some of the, from the officers and even some of the kids that we've had at our CAC have said that they remember that, that that officer did that for them. So to me, it's about, um, People who are in the field doing the work, giving of themselves, um, need they need they need to be able to have tools in their own tool belt to share with people. Lastly, I will say this to you. I had a former mentor of mine who, when I first got in this work uh, 41, 42 years ago, and I was chasing um, uh, kids in the community for Department of Youth Services, et cetera, et cetera, and X, Y, Z. And he said, I'm going to give you advice. And he said, it's called 80-20. And I said, 80-20, what do you mean? He said, here's what I'm going to tell you. Give 100% of 80% to your work, but take that 10, uh, 20 percent that's left and you protect it and you protect it and you protect it and don't let them in. Now, what you're gonna, is going to happen is there's going to be days and weeks and projects where you, they're going to be into 95% of your stuff, but try to get it back so that that 20% is yours. I don't care if that's your dog, your car, your whatever your hobby is, but just do it or else I'm going to be talking to you in two years and you're gonna be doing something entirely different than you're doing now. Christine, I had a comment, wanted to build on uh, Ed's comment. Um, yes. So two, two things. One is that um, uh, um, I, I really appreciate your, your going back to the, to the example of uh, the officers and how they can uh, you know, um, um, engage a scene. And um, I often speak to officers uh, before my work, the health department going around the country um, and oftentimes in the, in the academies and, you know, officers, officers have told me, you know, I'll never forget, you know, your story, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and just for example, I, I was, um, you know, during the three hour standoff with uh, my mother's ex-boyfriend um, in, in this sort of murder, murder suicide um, incident, um, police actually, uh, protected me in my space. And one of the things I thought was important that the officer did was that 
um, I couldn't speak. I couldn't, I was so afraid to speak and I, I was just so, I was traumatized, right? I was in shock. Uh, but the officer gave me some crayons and a piece of paper and had me draw. He, what he didn't know was that I was actually a good drawer as a kid. I, I could draw. I mean, I, they, they were stick figures, but like I could show you what, what I saw and I could depict that on a piece of paper. And I'll never forget that because it actually gave me an opportunity later on when we feel the guilt and the shame around the fact that I couldn't save my, my family members, there was something that I could do to be able to support whoever was doing whatever they were going to do. Police, police officers, they, 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 at least they knew what was happening with my mom and my brother at that time. And so I've always held on to that as a special thing, because now in programs that we have in the health department, we do art therapy with, 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 our, vict with our victims of crime. So look how that translated to being able to put some real um, um, support behind some practices that could be very impactful um, in terms of being able uh, to cope. And um, I think um, the last thing I'll say is, um, thank you so much, Judge um, Anderson, for the, for the tool. Um, I'm gonna take it myself. Um, I've been doing some um, some background information gathering. I wouldn't call it for research, but some background information gathering on burnout myself. And one of the things that um, I looked up was a great literature review. I can't quote this uh, right now, but in that literature review, review, it talked about the correlation between burnout um, and uh, um, burnout and um, uh, uh, in behavioral health systems um, and the role that. Uh, leadership styles play in terms of uh, impacting burnout. Um, and so be between transformational leaders, uh, transactional leaders, and uh, laissez-faire leaders or servant leaders, they found that transformational leaders who had the characteristics of that were more, uh, that, that, it, that it increased a, a more positive response to, to those, to burnout. And so there are some techniques and practices that we could use around leadership styles even to be able to um, address burnout in, in our systems and compassion fatigue. So I, I found that study, um, that literature review actually is really, really great to look at. So I get the, that's so important, and it touches on what Dr. Anderson was saying earlier, and I think we've all been alluding to, is the, the responder's level of burnout interferes with their ability to provide the mindful, trauma-focused intervention that the people we meet need, which then seems to me to exacerbate and, and create this, this system of our unending cycle. Um, one of the things that, that we see, I'm just going to do a quick time check. It's um, we're, we're, we're closing in on our time. I can't believe how quickly it happened. Um, I guess what we'll do is maybe me asking, instead of asking a final question, if I ask each one of you if there's something you want to offer as wrap up, and then we'll go back to Judge Ireland who will bring us to a close. Um, and uh, I'm going to assume you all want to say something as a final wrap up. It's your last word opportunity. And Ed, I'll start with you. Well, um, uh, first of all, it's been a real honor and privilege to be here. Um, and I've learned a lot. And as I said, uh, Mr. Killebrew, I will call you first thing in the morning. So uh, I, I just want to say that we've been so we have been spending a lot of time in with our some grant funding we have in take in terms of taking aces and trying to to work on that issue and i wanted to bring this up because i think it's important uh and we've been working with uh what we what have some people call drug endangered kids i would like to call them drug exposed children i think it's less stigmatizing but having said that because of the, the significant number of children some of the in our area our numbers here are as high as west virginia and ohio and one of the things that i think that I try to bring back to people because you brought that moment of you talked about trust. And when we look at the, when, when we work with our, with our communities, particularly our inner city communities, and we're working on opioid epidemic, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm often reminded that 25 years ago it was the war on drugs and we were building prisons. And now we got people screaming because 94% of the people who are dying of overdoses are Caucasian or white. We're screaming for more treatment beds. So that's, how do you build trust? How do you, how do you, it's over, it takes time. I think people have to know you, your word has to be your bond, but um, 
that's one of those uh, pieces of trust that when you talked about that, that hit home to me because I think it's, um, it's really important. It's one of those things that I think we need to be cautious, uh, conscious of and, uh, and try to move, through, move past if, we're, if possible. Hey, thanks, Ed. Judge Anderson. Thank you. Um, I am so pleased to have been able to be on this panel with, uh, my, with my co presenters. I have learned so much today. And I just want to thank you for sharing things with me that I hadn't even thought about. The librarian thing is the one that's just really sticking in my mind. Um, but I want to also share with you that uh, the secondary trauma is not something that's brand new. I mean, yes, the, the medical profession is about 30 years behind, but I'm gonna share something with you that makes me think that you, especially those of you who are in Massachusetts, um, can visualize that this kind of secondary trauma that comes from the courtroom has been around for a very long time. And here it is. Lizzie Borden with an ax gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. Witnesses see that, jurors see that, my court staff sees that, the attorneys see that, and the judges see that. And, and that has been around for a very, very long time and is very special to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thanks, Judge Anderson. Dr. Anderson, we'll go to you. Yeah, first of all, as well, I'd like to really thank you all for this opportunity. And I have a page of notes as well. So this was, uh, you know, really very informative. And I, I love the opportunity to come out of, out of my proverbial, proverbial echo chamber <laughs> out there and, and, and get into different rooms and get different voices. And what's uh, really refreshing as well to understand is that there are people in other silos yes. right, that are thinking and dealing with the same sorts of issues. But it does challenge us in many ways and challenges me, so I'm part of that us, to come out of these silos, uh, come out of the echo chambers more often. Let's start to really develop best practices together and realize that whether it's healthcare, law, education, um, at the heart of it, it's really about people uh, who are showing up, especially in these service-based industries, who are showing up to serve others. And with that, they're bringing certain things to that and they're interacting with individuals who are also bringing things to that that to that uh, that interaction, that point of service. So, really, I applaud you all for including me in this discussion, and, and thank you for that. Thank you, and thanks for what you do at the Dimmick Center. It's an amazing, amazing place over there. Thanks, thanks for being with us, William. You get the last word of yeah. the panel, anyway. I realize that, you know, in a, in, a, in a lot of times when we have the names going, my name is always at the end. And um, some people may feel like that's a real challenge, but I feel like I get a chance to listen to everyone and and, um, and, and not have the anxiety of going first. So to my first person who goes first, I appreciate the effort and the groundwork you all have laid. Um, it's just been an absolute wonderful opportunity to be on this panel with you all. I've learned so much as well. Um, and I'm so glad we have a chance to share our work and share our perspectives. And um, thank you to everyone at the uh, the conference who's made it happen. I gather if this was in person, we'd be in Massachusetts. So uh, Massachusetts is a special place uh, for me. I have a surrogate mom there, um, work that I've been doing there for years. In fact, we're moving around the country, Massachusetts and Lowell and, um, and Sudbury and many of the Cape Cod and many of the places where we trained and the clothesline. Uh, um, um, effort that was happening on, on Cape Cod. I've been a part of that, those concerts. So um, there's, a, there's a special place for Massachusetts in my heart. Um, and I'll close with saying that, um, you know, I can't keep libraries, Judge um, Anderson, out of my mind either, because the one thing that, that, that rings to me in this is that um, I, I often say we have to think uh, of being the one. And any one of us can be the one in whatever role we play. Um, we, when I um, first, uh, you know, ex when I experienced the murders, uh, I didn't get help till three years later by an assistant principal who recognized signs. He transitioned over. He helped me to get some help with a social worker, and that social worker worked with my grandmother. And so regardless of the role and the place where we are, 
uh, you know, we can be that one because if we have the skills and the difference is the skill set between knowing how, uh, you know, being aware and knowing how to address and recognize signs and be able to refer um, the individuals over appropriately is, is an important step. And I guess the last thing I'll um, just wrap, wrap up with is that um, I, I, I really think that, um, well, I'll just say being, being the one um, is, 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 is just a very important thing. And I, I lost my last point, but um, I know it's left with be the one. <laughs> I know it has to do with, we all can be the one. Oh, the last point I was going to make for a data point, um, Kessler did a study that showed that 61% of men and 51% of women in our general population experience have experienced at least one lifetime traumatic event. And so that means that this is not about those people we're, 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 we're supporting. This really is about um, all of us, Dr. Anderson, what you said, this is not about those people and pointing fingers. This is about all of us. And we all have experienced something. And when we we um, validate those experiences versus invalidate them, I think that we can bring a sense of mutuality into the space and the humanity into the space where trauma uh, often resides. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Judge Island, my deepest apologies. I completely lost track of time. I haven't left you much. Back to you. Not a problem. And Christine, thank you very much. And I want to thank our panelists. You folks were just fantastic. What a great conversation. Uh, it was excellent. Thank you. Now, uh, in behalf of the Ruffin Society, I want to thank all of you and our audience for joining us this afternoon as we conclude our discussion on criminal justice reform. We hope that you enjoyed today's session, Healing the Community and Ourselves. Our hope is that our three sessions have generated conversations and dialogue about criminal justice reform and some of the critical issues that we all face at this time. In our first session on the prosecutor's role in criminal justice reform, our keynote speaker was Supreme Judicial Court Chief Justice Kimberly Budd, and the panelists were Rachel Robbins, District Attorney for Suffolk County in Massachusetts, and Satana DeBerry, District Attorney for Durham County, North Carolina, and Andrea Cabral, former Secretary of Public Safety for Massachusetts. In our second session on criminal justice professionals on criminal justice reform, our keynote speaker was Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Our panelists were Keith Ellison, Minnesota's Attorney General, Yolanda Smith, Director of Public Safety at Tufts University, Pamerson Ifill, Deputy Commissioner of the Massachusetts Probation Service, and Branville Bard, former Cambridge Police Commissioner and currently Vice President of Public Safety for Johns Hopkins University. Each of the three sessions touched on issues and topics related to criminal justice reform. In the end, we know that without having open discussions and communication about these concerns, things won't and can't change. And criminal justice reform is all about change. One last time before I close, let me again remind you that we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Donations fuel our work. If you would like to contribute, you can do so by going to the convocation website, click on the heading that says more, and then click on the entry that says donate to the Ruffin Society. We appreciate your support. And with that, I close. And on behalf of Northeastern University, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society, I thank you again for joining us. Good evening.